Welcome to Everyday Champions. It's good to have you back with us as part of our ongoing conversation. Our conversations are about transformation. It's about going on a journey of becoming the person and becoming the people that God created us to be. Really understanding our true identity and how that leads to us impacting this world for Jesus and growing the influence of the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Well, we are continuing with our conversation around the Church I See. The Church I See document was written over 10 years ago, and it started as something that was in our hearts. And sometimes when things start in your heart, you don't fully see what it will look like with your eyes. It always starts like that. That's why as people of faith, we've got to realize it. We're never always going to understand or fully comprehend what we sense deep within us. But eventually, it starts to come to the surface. And and 10 years later, right now, where we are as everyday champions, we are starting to see with our eyes what 10 years ago we saw with our hearts. And that's exciting. But there's more to come. And so we are going to jump into the the document very shortly and kind of go to the next part of that. You can find this document on our website where you'll see it in its full entirety. It's going to take us a number of weeks to go through it. We've already been through the first kind of quarter of the document and you can go back on our YouTube channel and catch up on the conversations where we unpack uh, that a little more. But I want to ask you a question and this is linked to our first interaction and we like interaction, we love to create conversation and to find out a little bit more about those that we are watching this with and and what I'm going to just talk about right now is linked to that first interaction question which is this, what is your favorite room in the house? What is your favorite room in the house? And why is it your favorite room? Now, I've probably got kind of a couple of options here that I could go with, but I'm probably going to go with the lounge and I'm going to go with the fact that it's got my favorite chair in the lounge. It's a, I think it's called it's a chaise de lounge. Chaise de lounge. And, uh, and it's that kind of seat based where you can have your legs up. And I love to sit there and just relax at the end of a long day when it's been challenging and tough and just to kind of relax. And typically Woody will jump up with, onto the, the sofa with me. He's, he's our dog, by the way, just in case you're wondering who Woody is. And, and I just love just to sit there and relax. And, and so I love that room in the house. It's kind of like my favorite spot. I'd love to know what your favorite place in the house is. What's your favorite room and why? And let's add another question in here. What would make it better? Like what would make that room better? What, what enhancement, what improvement would you add to it to make it even better than it already is? We'll discuss this for a few moments and then we'll be back.
Well, why don't you put in the chat column right now if you're watching live. Let us know what that favorite room in the house was. Was it the lounge, bedroom, garden? What was it? Let us know and why. And what's the improvement that you would make? I'd love to see. You know, I was thinking about this for myself. You know, I, what improvement would I add to my chaise orange? you know, in the lounge, my favorite place. And I would love to have like a massage chair or a massage mechanism added to my chaise lounge. Yeah, I'm probably saying that completely wrong, by the way. And and I'd love to have it because just to sit there and have my, my neck and back massaged and, and just to sit there while watching the, the, the news, watching the sport. Oh, that, that would be amazing. I think we're going to have massage chairs in heaven. And Jesus did say, pray, might it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'm going to take that as the God, God's will for my life, okay? So that's my improvement. That's my enhancement. Well, that reminds me, by the way, I was talking to a neighbor, speaking of chairs, the other day, and uh, my elderly next door neighbor said, I've got a new stair lift. And I said, oh, I'd love to have a go. I'll give you 20 pounds to go on it. I think she's going to take me up on it. I think she's going to take me up on it. The offer, the chair up, stair lift. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Only dad joke for this broadcast. It's because my wife's not in the studio and I can get away with it. <laughs> well, we're going to jump into the Church I See statement and where we are next because it's linked to that discussion question. Not about chaise lounge and uh, massage chairs, but it's about a house with many rooms. So this is the statement, the next part we're going to look at. The Church I See is one house with many rooms, different sizes and at different stages of growth, appearing in increasingly more places with a greater reach. If we're going to understand what church is. We've got to get back to the first principles of what Jesus meant when he was referring to it. The word church in the Greek, which is, of course, the language that the New Testament is largely written in, Greek and Aramaic, but the term church is the term ecclesia. So when we talk about the church I see is one house with many rooms, we're talking about the ecclesia, that we see. Now, what is the ecclesia? Because this may change how you currently see the church. Because let's face it, we've all got those images in our mind. The moment we hear the word church of buildings, of our experience, of places where we've had weddings, funerals, church gatherings, like that's the, the kind of dominating picture in our minds. And of course, in Everyday Champions, we're starting to break that down and, and hopefully now we don't immediately go to that picture. But let's face it, we've been in that for a long time. So that likely is to still be one of the things that we go to in terms of the pictures in our minds. But Ecclesia was a Roman concept. It was a Roman concept, meaning called out people. It was where people would be called out of their homes and they would come together for the purpose of decision making, either in a religious or a political context. And so the, the Romans took this Greek concept, which is the Romans did a lot of that. They took on a lot of the Greek uh, ideology and and philosophy and they they took that and they implemented that as part of their culture and so this idea of of the ecclesia was that citizens that, that were those were people who were legally part of the roman empire they could come out together and based upon their identity as citizens they could be part of making decisions relating to their community. So there was an authority attached to their identity and their influence was activated when they came together. It wasn't activated on their own. It was activated when they came together. Okay. And that's a really important thing to realize because this is the concept that Jesus was speaking of when he spoke about the church. The church are the called out ones who, based upon their identity as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, activate 
that authority, when they come together for the purpose of making choices and decisions that influence the community around them. So I wanted to go into the Apostle Paul's letter to Corinthians, because in this letter, we can start to see uh, what Paul saw as an apostle, which is a master builder of the church, what Paul saw as the the reason for the church and our role to play as as the church. Okay, so let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 9. For we are co-workers in God's service, and you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. What Paul here is reminding us is that you are not a spectator. You are an active participant. You are not a spectator. You are an active participant. And so the reason why this is absolutely key is that this is point number one. We have to make this shift from congregating to co-working. From congregating to co-working. Now, you know, congregating and co-working are two completely different things. And, and I, I, as I was preparing this, I had flashbacks of my science lessons. Now, I used to hate science. I, it wasn't because necessarily everything we talked about was, was boring, because I didn't think it was boring. It's just the way my mind works. I just couldn't do the work that I was being asked to do. And so I would often struggle with the tasks that were given. So I had this strategy. The strategy was look for the smartest people in the room and then get alongside them, congregate with them and make it look like you're working with them. But in all honesty... I wasn't adding much to that group at all. I was just riding on their coattails, as it were. I was, I was benefiting from their knowledge of knowing what to do. I was a spectator. I was not an active participant. And I did that because I couldn't participate or I struggled to participate. And I was thinking about this because that's exactly what it's like when it comes to the church. Think about back to the first principles of what the, the ecclesia is. It's a called out people. In other words, you are called out for a purpose, to work, to add your voice to a decision-making process. You don't just become a spectator when you're part of a meeting. You know, if you've, if you've ever been in a meeting, in work or a meeting in a community and you know you're not just there to spectate you're there to add your voice you're there to add the weight of your authority based upon your position in that meeting your role at work or your role in that team or your role in that community and and that's what the church is whenever the church comes together we are to be active participants we are co-workers in God's service we are co-workers in God's service. Now, it's really important to understand why we've been on the journey as a church that we've been on as Everyday Champions. You know, our previous model did not make active participation essential. You could easily, in the Church 1.0 model, rock up and simply consume. You could be a spectator. In fact, you know, I remember being in many leaders' meetings where people would talk about the fact that, you know, there's always 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. There's always 20% of the people, and those people usually get exhausted because they're overstretched, trying to make things happen. And that would make it very easy for people just to, to turn up and to be a spectator. And the result is that you end up with a powerless church because think about it. If the church are the called out ones who, based upon their identity as citizens, are called to impact their environment based upon their authority as those called out ones, then if we are not active participants, the power is linked to the authority. Think about it. You know, a, a policeman's power 
is linked to his authority. And then when he uses that authority, he, it is given to him. But if we don't recognize that we have that authority, then the likelihood is we will just simply become spectators. And it results in being powerless. We, we, our power is in the authority that has been given to us. We have no power in and of ourselves. It is a power that, uh, based upon the authority that Jesus gave us. All authority, we talked about this last week, has been given to me. And I give it to them. We have been given all authority. But our model did not create an environment where it was essential to be an active participant. But of course, in the model that we are now, and let me say right now, we're, we're not finished yet. We're on a journey, okay? We've only just started, just to let you know. But the model now is creating a need for you to be an active participant. Because how many of you know you can't just rock up in somebody's house and just be a spectator? You have to get more involved. You have to add your voice. You can't just remain silent. You can't sit on the back row in somebody's living room and, and, and leave uh, before the final song. Yeah, you can't because that's not the setup. So even the model now is going back to the original model where in multiple places in Scripture we see that the church met in the house, in people's houses. Paul would talk about you know, the church that meets in this person's house. And so we are called to move from congregating to co-working. When we talk about um, one house, many rooms, we're talking about the one house, which is God's house, his house, not my house, not Leanne's house, not everyday champion's house, it's his house. We're talking about many rooms. We're talking about uh, distributing the, the work that is to be done in terms of, of impact in this world for Jesus. Not to the 20%, but to the 100%. Many rooms is about the, increasing the space that the church moves into. And that means that not only have we got to move from congregating to co-working, and this next point is a phrase that we've looked at in our circles in recent months, we've got to move from believing to building. We've got to move from believing to building. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. Notice, each one, not 20% of the ones, <laughs> each one should build and build with care care. Paul talks about the fact that he is a master builder. He is an apostle. He laid the foundation. That's what an apostle does. They lay the foundation. And his job and the role of the apostle was to bring alignment across the body, to bring alignment. A master builder is like that, that key builder on any work site or building site, construction site, where all of the different trades will go to that master builder who has the architect plans and will keep all the trades in alignment to that plan. Because otherwise, each area goes off and does its own thing. And that was the apostles' job, to bring alignment. That was why the early church in Acts 2.42 devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Why? Because the church was spread everywhere, in many rooms, in increasingly uh, numerous amount of rooms as people were added to the church. They didn't build a mega complex. The church had many rooms, but it was one house. And the way that they, of course, that's always the challenge. The moment you kind of spread out, it's going, how do we keep everybody heading in the same direction? And that was the job of the apostles teaching to bring alignment to say, okay, this is the blueprint. This is the pattern. And everybody took that pattern and through conversation that brought transformation in people's lives, which meant everybody headed in the same direction. The church was united. The body was together as one. And that's what we have to now focus on in Everyday Champions. How do we enable people to meet in more rooms 
and some people will meet in circles, which of course is our kind of small concept of, of small kind of gatherings of, of church coming together and then periodically coming together for larger uh, celebrations. But how do we keep everybody in alignment? Well, in order to keep everybody in alignment, we've got to have workers. Those people on the building site no, I've got to get to the master plan so that I know what I'm doing today. Can you imagine just kind of workers turning up to the building site saying, right, well, I'm here now. I'll just have a little wander around and <laughs> have a little look at what the plumbers are doing, have a little look at what the, the electricians are doing as they do their first fix and their second fix, you know, uh, and, and just spectating and then wandering off site. No, that's not what you do. You go to a building site to build. You don't just go along and say, oh, do you know what? I really believe in what you guys are doing. I just really believe that, you know, putting this bathroom together is such an important job. And I just want to encourage you in what you're doing. No, you don't do that. It's not, you're not to stay a believer. You're to say, I want to get my hands dirty. I want to be a builder. And Paul here is saying, each one should build. Each one should build with care. And and here's the thing, and we're going to go into our second interaction now. We have to understand the difference between being a consumer and a producer. We've got to understand what is the attitude and the behavior of a consumer and what's the attitude and behavior of a producer. Because... Our church, Everyday Champions, is only going to grow, grow in, in its maturity, grow in its impact, its influence, grow in its numbers as we become builders. It can't rely, it can't be a, a, a hybrid model of, well, we're in homes now, but it's still 20% driving the 80%. No, 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 no. This has to be an empowering, equipping model where you as citizens, understanding your identity, know I am called to be a, a co-worker. I am to build. And so we've got to start to look at, okay, what does this look like? What's it going to look like when we come together in our circles, whether that's a midweek circle, mid uh, a weekend circle, whether that's online or in person? And we're going to discuss this right now. What does, what does the attitude and behavior of a consumer and a producer look like? And what does this look like like, practically when we come together as circles? So that's the interaction question I want to leave you with right now for a few moments. Press pause if you want to take longer to discuss it, because this is a really important point, and I really want you to think about your context right now. Uh, You know, if you're not part of Everyday Champions, then think about your current context of church. What does a consumer versus a producer attitude and behavior look like. But for us as everyday champions, I really want us to think now about the the context that we currently now have as church. When we come for the social uh, element and we come together and we're inviting people along, when we come together for our midweek weekend circles, when we come together for our celebrations, what does the attitude and behavior of a consumer and a producer look like? Okay, spend some moments on this and then we'll be back.
brilliant. It is so important that we spend time understanding the distinctions. Because let's face it, left to our own devices, we all have that default to become a spectator and to become someone who is simply you know, consuming what is happening. We all have that potential to do that. And as Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all. We can sometimes convince ourselves, no, I'm an active participant, but really I'm disguising the fact that really I am a spectator. There's more I could be doing to contribute. And, and, and that's the thing. It's not even just kind of an either or. It's a sliding scale. There's always more that we could be doing to contribute. And it's important to look at this as Paul reminds us in the next part of, of 1 Corinthians 3 that we see this with the end in mind. The third point is this, that we've got to move from consuming to contributing. We've got to move from consuming to contributing. And, and we've got to move from the level that we're currently at to the next level. It's, um, it's, part, it's linked to our maturity in Christ. Today, I should be contributing more than I was a year ago. Now, let me just say this point before I read what Paul says. This isn't about getting busier. A busyness is usually a form of artificial significance you know in other words oh i'm just so busy i'm just so busy and that almost becomes like a, a a a kind of a badge that i wear as a badge of pride oh i'm just so busy you know busyness is either artificial in, uh, significance or it is laziness and sometimes it's both you know laziness could be literally just because i don't say no to things either out of fear or i just don't stop and think about how i could use my time better so this isn't just about becoming uh, busier. This isn't just when, to do more. I've got to do more. I've got to do more. And of course, none of this is from a place of trying to earn acceptance or earn uh, love from God or from others. We should never do that. But we should be inspired to become more and more fruitful. You know, in John 15, I wasn't planning on saying this, but in John 15, uh, the vine dresser does two things to the vine in order for it to be more fruitful. Firstly, it cuts off the branches that bears no fruit. And then secondly, it cuts back the branches that are bearing fruit but could produce more. To me, that speaks about how God as, a, uh, as a, an efficient and effective manager, you know, looking at what needs cutting off and what needs cutting back. And I believe there's a very practical area of that in our lives. And not only does it apply to our beliefs, you know, what are the beliefs that we need to cut off because they're lies? What are the beliefs that we need to cut back because maybe actually we, we are, are not quite seeing them correctly or not applying them effectively? But I believe it also applies practically to our lives. You know, what needs cutting off? in our lives? What needs cutting back so that we can contribute more? Maybe there's a practical area in our finances where, you know, actually I need to cut back on my consumption of something so that I can increase my contribution to something. And, and that could also be to our time. You know, I, maybe I need to stop going to this place so often so that I can increase the time of going to this other place, my circle, socializing, connecting with people for the purposes of the mission, and I can therefore contribute more. Again, it's a shift from consuming to contributing that we all can't just say, oh, I've made that shift. You, we're always making that shift, okay? So let me get to what Paul goes on to say in this passage, our main passage here. Paul says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So, Paul reminds us that we're a builder, whether we recognize it or not. We are building. E even if we're only acting as a believer right now, and we're spectating rather than being active participants. The truth is we are building. 
But what we're building our lives with won't last. We're building out of materials like uh, wood, hay and straw, which ultimately when the time of testing comes, that time when we all have to uh, come before the Father and give an account for what we've done with what he's given to us, you know, that isn't going to stand the test. It doesn't affect our salvation, but it affects our eternal reward and responsibility that we're given in heaven and in the new earth. And so it's so important that we realize that we are building whether we like it or not. Now what we've got to do is ask ourselves the question, what are the quality, what is the quality of the materials that I'm using? And the quality of the materials that we're using are, are, are based upon our true understanding of, of who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. That actually I'm a citizen I'm a called out person and I am called to impact and influence this earth for the kingdom of God. And when I make all of my choices, my relationship choices, my financial choices, my career choices, my health choices, all go in the direction of I am here to contribute, to build as a called out citizen of the kingdom. Then what happens is the quality of my materials, which comes down to the quality of my choices, goes up. Up. And I actually believe actually not only do the quality of my choices go up, but actually the quantity of my choices go down. Because many of us get decision fatigue and choice fatigue. In other words, I'm constantly have to make decisions because actually I'm, I'm operating out of place of chaos, not out of place of peace. When we learn to operate from the state of rest that we're called to as children of God, then actually we end up being more effective managers of our lives and then the quantity of our decisions goes down, which means we can take more time to make quality choices. And so bringing this right back to the church I see, the church I see talks about different sizes and different stages of growth. Now remember, I think when I first wrote this, I was still seeing it through the eyes of church 1.0. In other words, when I would say different sizes and different stages of growth, I was thinking different sizes and stages of growth of, of locations of a multi-site model of church. You know, different locations and you'd have small locations, large locations. But when I wrote these words, the words were right, but the concept was wrong. The concept was wrong. The concept now is that the church, which is you and me, we are at different stages of growth because we are the church and the circles that we meet in the number of circles that meet in different locations will be at different stages of 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 increase we will have a circle that might appear in a certain location it'll just be one circle it could just be two or three that's all that's needed that's jesus's words but then over time those circles start to multiply because they are builders, not just consumers. They're not just believers. They are coming together, recognizing we are called to meet together to make decisions that are going to impact and influence the area and space where we are called to operate. And let me just remind you of this. You know, when Jesus said, and we looked at this uh, last week, I think it was, when Jesus said, go into all the world um, and, and, and preach the gospel. When Jesus said that, the, the actual way of reading what he said there, and the, the, the verb is not to go. It's actually as you go preach, as you go teach. In other words, it's to be fully integrated into your current life. It's not, okay, I, I need to stop doing my work now so that I can go into all the world. No, it's as you go, as you go about your daily life, bring the kingdom of God. As you go about your daily life, meet the church, get together, have the circles, find different ways of coming together because there is work for you to do. There is a world for you to impact. And of course, our job as leaders is to equip you to bring that alignment that keeps us all heading in the right direction. Now, let me just say at this point, and we're going to come into land with a final interaction question. Uh, one of the things that 
we I realized that we needed to do on this journey for us to kind of start to see the church increase to become one house but many rooms with a greater number and a greater reach which is part of the statement as well which is the the purpose of our gathering to reach further into places where we can impact people's lives that we need to stop measuring according to the old metrics you know the old metrics would be well how many people have we got in the building how many people have we got on team how many people have we got giving how many people and and, and there was nothing wrong per se with those metrics because you know genuinely they were driven by a desire to to see people's lives impacted and and people's lives were impacted you know many of us right now are part of this because we were part of that model and we were saved in that model and so you know it's not all bad but it just wasn't fully effective in terms of measuring against its potential and so there are five different stages of growth that we measure so when we talk about uh, you know, different stages of growth, the church, we've got to understand what's the metric that we're going to use. You know, we know a human being goes through from a baby to a toddler, you know, to a, a, an older child, to a teenager, to a young adult. We know the stages of growth. We know how to measure that, what they should be doing at each stage. And, uh, and what we've got to do now is understand what are those measurements of growth going forward for us as the church. That's us, the people. That's us when we come together. How do we equip you so you know, yeah, do you know what? I am, I am growing. I, uh, I'm developing. I am contributing as I should rather than being a consumer. And so let me quick, quick, quickly give you these five different areas that we're going to measure. And we're actually going to take the next five weeks to unpack these and then we're going to come back to the church i see statement okay this is so important that we do this so those five areas are we for us to be a builder not just a believer to be a contributor and not just a consumer here are five things that we need to do we need to engage in personal mission after all that's our purpose we need to encourage others through our gifts that's worship. When you come together, bring a psalm, a hymn, spiritual song. Three, equip others through coaching. That's discipleship. Four, embrace the challenge of goal setting. That's growing our faith, setting a goal because we want to grow, we want to develop. We want to, five, exercise stewardship planning. How do we as I mentioned earlier, look at the things we need to cut off in our lives and cut back on so that we can actually grow what God has given to us in terms of our resources. And so those five areas are key areas that we're going to be focusing on that will help us to measure, according to that statement that we've, we've just read out, you know, the church I see is one house with many rooms, different sizes and at different stages of growth. Well, the different stages of growth are based upon those five different areas. And, and if we can grow you and you can grow me, then the church grows. And it won't just grow in terms of us growing. It will grow because as we are at work, we start to see more people added to the kingdom of God and his church. So we're going to unpack those a little bit more practically in the next five weeks. But here's the third and final interaction question. What can I do to increase my level of contribution when we gather together as the church? What can I do to increase my level of contribution? I want to be a producer. I want to be God's co-worker. I want to be a, someone who builds with care. What must I stop doing in order to not simply be a consumer? Okay, so what do I need to increase in terms of my level of contribution as a producer? And what must I stop doing in order to not simply become a consumer? Let's discuss this, set a goal, and then we'll come into land.
Well, I hope you've got your goal set. And I hope as a circle with those that you're watching with, that you have a date in the diary or the next time that you meet, you remind one another of that goal. How did you get on? And again, the whole purpose of setting a goal is not to catch people out. It's to have a point of accountability. It kind of focuses our minds. It gives us something to to kind of stretch toward, uh, but also to celebrate when actually we do what it is that we set out to do. You know, truly, if we believe what we've been talking about in this conversation, that we are God's co-workers, that we are to build with care, then we have to become people who set goals. And so well done on doing that. And, you know, we're coming to land now. And, you know, just a thought came to my mind because we're talking about, you know, one house and many rooms. You know, in the past year, in fact, a year this month, as at the point of recording, uh, we moved back into our home in Greenwich and, and essentially started kind of dual location in terms of, 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 of living because of work um, and because of what we believe as a church and as leaders of our church, we need to position ourselves. And London has already always played a major part of our vision um, as well as, as, as Newark, where I grew up and, and, and love to live as well. And, and it's been a, sh- a stretch of a year. It's been a stretch in, in numerous ways. Uh, but one of the things that as I reflect upon this past year is, you know, there have been times when I've been in Greenwich and I've been there alone because, you know, Leanne had to be in Newark or, or I, ha- I had to quickly come across to London. And, and it's, it's funny because whenever I'm in a house alone, it doesn't matter which house I'm in, it just doesn't feel like home. And, and, and living between two houses, I've realized it isn't about the house. It isn't about that as in the physical building. It's whenever we are together. Whenever we are together. And that includes the dog as well. <laughs> but whenever we're together, that's what makes the home. That's what makes the home. And the truth is, we could be together in a cabin somewhere. We could be together in outer Mongolia in a tent, although I'm not sure Leanne would be up for the tent thing. In fact, I don't think any of us would be up for the tent thing, um, other than maybe Ruben. Uh, But, you know, we could be anywhere. And the truth is, it's when we are gathered together, that's when we are family. And I want us to, to be reminded that, you know, it isn't about the building, the house, the physical space that I am in. It's who I'm with. And that's the ecclesia. It's where two or three are gathered. It's who I'm with and who they represent. And and I think we've got to keep reminding ourselves of that. Allow that principle to drive everything that we do. Because let me tell you right now, the church I see is one house with many rooms, different sizes, and at different stages of growth, appearing in increasingly more places pathways of business, education, media, arts, family, sport, the sciences, all these different pathways of our society, the church is going to be appearing with a greater reach because those people who are the church are co-working with God. They are building with care. They are producers, not consumers. And they are growing and they are measuring their growth as disciples of Christ, not to gain acceptance, but to be vessels through which heaven can come to earth. Father, I want to thank you for our time together today. Thank you for our conversation. Thank you for the laughter. Thank you for the challenge. Thank you for those ouch moments when, Holy Spirit, you you remind us of maybe what we've stop doing and we need to start again or maybe what we need to stop doing uh, because we've become consumers or, or or spectators forgive us father for the times when we have lowered our standards thank you for having high standards of us because you've created us to live according to those standards and through christ we can live out the life that you've called us to and the mission that you've called us uh, to as well father we thank you because The one house of your church is growing from strength to strength. It is moving into new places and spaces. And we believe in everyday champions, more circles will be started. More people will open homes. More people will meet in coffee shops. More people will meet in bars. More people will meet in in places of work. 
And Father, we thank you because it is your kingdom growing from strength to strength. Thank you for calling us to this exciting mission. Father, we thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, listen, remember today and every day, you are a champion and there's more inside of you than you think. Until next time, take care.